and uh, to international law and human rights. Talking about partnerships, you know better than me, Mr. President, that the success story, the best example is the trilateral that we have between Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus since 2014. And we have managed to do a lot through this partnership in all aspects, especially in security, terrorism, in energy, a very, very important issue that through energy cooperation, we can have security and energy security and economic growth. And now about Nostos. This is a very, very good example of how we can have regional cooperation. Two years ago, together with Nabila and our counterparts in Greece, we have started this program in your presence, Mr. Uh, President and Mr. Anastasiadis and Mr. Pavlopoulos at Alexandria. And we have managed there to, to bring people living in Alexandria a long time ago from Greece and Cyprus together. We call it nostos because it's a Greek word, nostalgia, memories. Then we moved to London and we did it there with our youth and then to Melbourne. And we discuss issues like climate change, like the role of the youth in our politics. So this is Nostos and we continue, Mr. President, with next Nostos number four. We are going to meet in Athens with Nabila and our counterpart there. Uh, and we are going to concentrate on youth because we want our youth to learn the history, the culture of each other. We want our youth to participate in what we are doing in our region. Thank you so much, Mr. Fotheo, for sharing this and uh, uh, speaking about the uh, security. I think Malta has a different uh, style of uh, securing the immigrants. Your Excellency, Ms. Maria Camilleri, in light of the economic boom in Malta, we would like to ask you about the decision that the Maltese government made to establish a special body to combat the exploitation of foreign workers and my question is, how can the governmental decision affect the migrant integration in society? Thank you. First and foremost, I would like to thank Your Excellency, of the Republic of Egypt. And welcome all honorable members. I would like to convey رسالة من فخامة دكتور جورج فالا يقدم بها الشكر الجزيل لك على دعوة ممثل من مالطا كما أود أيضا أن أشكرك لأنك سمحت لي بمخاطبة الشباب الموجودين هنا هذه المنصة منصة مهمة للغاية يسعدني أن أستمع إلى الشباب وأن أشارك إلى هذه المناقشات الإقليمية لأن ذلك يعطي فرصة للشباب حتى يخلقون تغييرا إيجابيا فيما يخص كيفية إدماج المهاجرين في المجال الاقتصادي أولا وبادئا ببدء أود أن أشير إلى الإنسان دائما كان رحالا بحثا عن حياة أفضل لنفسه أنه لا يمكن لشخص ما حتى هذا اليوم أن يخاطر بحياته لتذهب سدى ولكن ولسوء الحظ كما قيل سلفا كما قال زميلي الآخر العنف والحرب والكوارث البيئية تدفع بالناس إلى الهجرة هذه المؤشرات مؤشرات قوية
مشكلات كبيرة ولا سيما في مجال البنية التحتية وفي مجالات أخرى أود أن أشير إلى الاستثمار وتوفير الرعاية الصحية وما إلى ذلك وهنا تقدر بي الإشارة إلى أنه في السنوات الأخيرة السكان في مالطا تزايدوا بنسبة مئة ألف على الأقل عندما نفكر مثلا في منطقة أو مساحة مالطا مالطا بلدي مساحتها 300 و 800 ألف كيلو متر مربع وكأنها نقطة في المحيط وتعاني من الكثافة السكانية الكبيرة ولكن بفضل التنمية الجارية في بلدي نحن بحاجة إلى رفع معدلات التوظيف والتشغيل نحن بحاجة إلى زيادة العمال ويقدر أنه في العام القادم سنحتاج إلى عشرة آلاف شخص للانضمام إلى القوة العاملة بملطة أعطيكم فكرة عامة مدارس في ملطة 36 منها من الأجانب من الطلاب الأجانب تتلقى المدارس الطلاب ويحصل الطلاب على التعليم المجاني والرعاية الصحية المجانية فيما يخص المهاجرين لدينا الهجرة الشرعية وغير الشرعية ولكن مالطا تبذل قصارى جهدها وهي من أعلى الأماكن وأفضلها التي تعطي للمهاجرين حق اللجوء وكما يعلم الجميع مالطا تستضيف الكثير من المحادثات الثنائية مع الدول الأخرى لإعادة توطين المهاجرين الشرعيين أنتقل الآن إلى طريقة إدماج المهاجرين في المجال الاقتصادي المحادثات مستمرة بين الحكومات والنقابات العمالية وأرباب العمل والمؤسسات المهنية لتشكيل ووضع سياسة موحدة خاصة بالعمال وعلينا أن نضع نصب أعيننا أن مالطا تتبع ضوابط الاتحاد الأوروبي وهناك أيضا مساحة ووجود للعمال غير الشرعيين المهاجرين غير الشرعيين لأنه أحيانا يصعب حتى علينا التفرقة أعتذر عن المقاطعة هذا النموذج نموذج ناجح للغاية يشير إلى إمكانية إدماج المهاجرين داخل النظام الاقتصادي في الجولة التالية من التوصيات أود أن أستمع إلى رأي سيادتك في كيفية تطبيق ذلك في كافة دول البحر المتوسط شكرا جزيلا شكرا الآن سؤال يتوجه إلى السيد إلياس بوسعب سيد إلياس من واقع منصبكم كوزير للدفاع اللبناني في فترة تشهد الكثير من التطورات تطورات سياسية تطورات أمنية وخاصة التطورات الخاصة بمنطقة البحر المتوسط كيف ترى سيادتكم التعاون بين دول المتوسط فيما يخص ثلاثة أمور في الحقيقة ثلاثة أمور في خمس دقائق ده تحدي صعب الجريمة عذرة للحدود وعصابات تهريب البشر وأيضا مسألة أمن المتوسط شكرا راح احاول بخمس دقائق يمكن اقل اذا قدرت بس بدايه بدي احمل تحيات فخامه رئيس الجمهوريه العماد ميشيل عون الى فخامه الرئيس عبد الفتاح السيسي واشكرك على دعوه لبنان عبر الرئاسه للمشاركه في هذا المؤتمر ولكن الشكر الاكبر فخامه الرئيس ليس لحسن الضيافه ولا استقبالنا الشكر الاكبر لك فخامه الرئيس هو لاهتمامك الحقيقي والصادق بمستقبل الشباب وأكرر الحقيقي والصادق للوقت الذي تعطيه لهذه المسألة لأن كلنا نعرف أن مستقبل عالمنا العربي هو إلى السؤال التعاون ضروري جدا بين دول البحر الأبيض المتوسط ودول المنطقة 
في هذه المجالات التعاون ضروري ولكن ضروري أكثر أنه التعاون يكون أو بصب لمصلحة الشباب لأنه بداية مثل ما قلت هم مستقبل هذه المنطقة وكل الدول والهجرة والنزوح وأسماء عديدة أعطيت لي الأزمة التي نعيش فيها في المنطقة هي أزمة كبيرة ونحن بلبنان فينا نكون عم نعطي أمثلة عديدة لبنان بلد في أربعة مليون نسمة أربعة مليون نسمة عاش أزمتين من النزوح والهجرة الهجرة الفلسطينية حوالي خمسمائة ألف فلسطيني موجودين في لبنان وبعد أكثر من خمسين سنة ما زال وضعهم غير نهائي وغير إنساني والمجتمع الدولي لتاريخ هذه اللحظة لم يتحمل مسؤوليته الصادقة لحل هذه المشكلة زاد عليها الأزمة في الوطن العربي وما يعرف ما أتت من كوارث بعدما كان ما يسمى الربيع العربي وسمعنا اليوم الأمين العام لجامعة الدول العربية ونظرته لهالموضوع وأنا بشارك هذه النظرة إنما هذا أتى بنزوح أكثر من مليون ونص سوري إلى لبنان يعني صار عندنا مليونين نازح على الأراضي اللبنانية في بلد فيه أربعة مليون نسمة لبنان قام بواجبه الإنساني فتح المدارس الشباب اللبناني الأساتذة الدكاترة في المستشفيات استقبلوا في بيوتهم في مدارسهم في منازلهم مليونين نازح سوري وما زلنا نتحمل هذا العبء بما يأتي من عبء مالي وأمني واقتصادي على لبنان المجتمع الدولي وعد الكثير في حل هذه الأزمة وبمساعدات إنسانية وفعلت هذه المنظمات أمور كثيرة ساعدت فيه النازحين إنما البلد المضيف بقي وحيدا يتحمل هذه الأزمة ونعيش اليوم تداعياتها نعيش اليوم أزمة كبيرة في لبنان الاقتصادية يمكن مش الكل انتبه شو هو سببها سببها تراكمات أخطاء كبيرة عبر الأربعين سنة الماضي في السياسات الاقتصادية لكن فجر هذا الموضوع العبء الكبير الذي يتحمله من النازحين غير العبء الاقتصادي والمالي في الأمن والإرهاب الذي ينشأ من هكذا أمور وأنا اليوم في لقاء ثنائي مع وزير الدفاع المصري الفريق أول محمد زكي ناقشنا موضوع الأمن والإرهاب وضرورة أن البلد يحمي نفسه بالأول ليقدر يحمي مجتمع ويحمي المواطنين والنازحين الموجودين فيه وكما قلت فخامة الرئيس للإرهاب لا يوجد دين ولا يوجد جنسية الإرهاب هي حالة شاذة يجب أن نتعاون معها ولكن للأسف ضمن ما يسمى بمخيمات نازحين كنا عم نشوف أنه يوجد هناك بؤر أمنية وعشناها في لبنان كان في مخيمات داخلها نازحين وعم نأمن لها المساعدات خرج منها إرهابيين ولو عددهم 2% من النازحين ولكن كانوا كافيين أنه ينطلقوا ويطلقوا النار على الجيش اللبناني ويقتلوا ضباط وعناصر الجيش اللبناني فأساءوا للمخيمات وللنزوح ولأمن النازحين ومنهم صدر من يتاجر ب البشر بتجارة البشر وتهريب البشر من بلد إلى آخر هذه كل أمور لازم يكون في تعاون بين دول البحر الأبيض المتوسط ودول العالم لأن هذا الموضوع ما بيكون محدود بعالمنا ما في شيء اسمه أمن منطقة داخل بلد أو, أو أمن بلد لحاله اليوم صرنا بظرف البلدان كلها لازم تكون عم بتشارك مع بعض البعض لحتى تأمن أمن للعالم وهذا اليوم التعاون يجب أن يكون دوليا بسبب التكنولوجيا اللي وصلنا لها يمكن فخامة الرئيس بخبرته بيعرف أن الحروب لم تعد حروب تقليدية بالدبابات والطيارات وإلى آخره صار في اليوم حروب من نوع آخر جرائم عبر التكنولوجيا جرائم منظمة جرائم كلها يمكن بده يكون في شيء من من واجهه بالارتفيشال انتليجنس بالذكاء الـ الـ الصناعي وبالتكنولوجيا وبالامن وبالاستخبارات 
أنا ما بدي طول حتى ضل ضمن الخمس دقائق ولكن بدي أقول يجب أن يكون هناك تعاون بين كل هذه الدول والشباب يجب أن يكون له دور كبير في هذا الموضوع وأنا بفتخر أنا وداخل على القاعة شفت أنه داعيين من كل العالم شباب موجودين هون وفرحت لما شفت ناس من لبنان مثل فرح وفاطمة وشفيق كريستوفر قاعدين هون جايين وتفاجأت أنه موجودين هون وعندهم نفس الاهتمام فخامة الرئيس الشباب في العالم كله اهتمامه واحد واللي عم تقوموا فيه بهذا المنتدى قد يكون مؤثر لمستقبل الشباب وشكرا شكرا شكرا سيد إلياس إذا حديث السيد إلياس عن كون ولو نسبة بسيطة من المهاجرين يقومون بأعمال متطرفة أو ما يسمى إرهاب دولي يسيء إلى سمعة كل المهاجرين ويصعب المهمة حتى على الدول التي تريد دمج هؤلاء المهاجرين في بلادها عودة إلى السؤال عن التعليم وسؤالنا لمسز سوفيا زخاري سوفيا from your experience as a Greek deputy minister على خبرتك كنائب وزير التعليم باليونان وبناء على دراستك كيف يمكننا أن نمكن الشباب من خلال التعليم تعليم يعود بالنفع على الشباب وعلى المجتمعات بأسرها سؤال آخر كيف يمكن للتنمية أن تدمج المهاجرين داخل المجتمعات شكرا جزيلا على هذا السؤال واسمحوا لي أولا أن أنقل إليكم تحيات رئيس الوزراء ومنذ عدة أشهر التقيت به في القاهرة وقلنا أن مصر وقال أن مصر بلده الثاني وأكد أن مصر البلد الثاني للجميع بسبب حفاوة الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة ونحن نتقدم بجزيل الشكر على ذلك وأود أيضا أن أشكر المنظمين ومدير منتدى شباب العالم أصحاب الفخامة إن الحكومة التي أتت في يوليو 2019 كانت حكومة جديدة لديها تحديات منذ الكثير من السنوات التعليم وكما نعلم ركيزة أساسية عليها أن تتصدى للكثير من المشكلات بعض المشكلات مشكلات مشتركة ولكن نود أن نرى شباب اليوم قادة الغد وإن أردنا أن نحقق ذلك إذا فعلينا أن ندرك أن كل الإصلاحات عليها أن تحدث وأن تحدث الآن ما الذي أعنيه بالإصلاحات أو الإصلاحات الكبرى في هذا الصدد علينا أن نبدأ منذ البداية منذ التحاق الطفل بالمدرسة في سن الرابعة علينا أن نعلم الطفل المهارات الرقمية والمهارات الاجتماعية من أجل أن نضمن لهم النجاح في الحياة بالطبع هناك فجوة في المهارات بين قطاع التعليم وبين سوق العمل وعلينا ألا نغفل في هذا السياق الجانب الإنساني يجب أن نعلم الأطفال القيم الأساسية وقيم حقوق الإنسان واتفاقات حقوق الإنسان يجب أن نساعد الأطفال ليصبحوا أكثر تسامحا عندما يوجد زميل معهم في الفصل يختلف عنه ولذا نحن نحاول أن نقدم وحدات تعليمية جديدة في العام الدراسي القادم تشمل قيم التطوع و قيم احترام الآخر ومبادئ ريادة الأعمال ولكن ذكرتم شيء مهم للغاية يتعلق بالإدماج إدماج الشباب الشباب الذين أتوا إلى اليونان سأعطيكم بعض الأرقام المهمة أتى مئة ألف من اليونان في خلال الأزمة الماضية التي بدأت في عام 2015 وما ذلك مستمرة 5600 منهم من الصغار أو من القصر وهذا أمر مهم للغاية وعلينا أن نشير إلى الأطفال الذين يأتون إلى البلاد دون مرافقة ذويهم ما الذي يحدث في اليونان وضعنا آلية لإدماج الأطفال داخل قطاع التعليم 
عبر دورات تعليمية وعبر مناهج تعليمية أيضا ونجح الأمر سيدي الفي طفل يعيشون في مراكز إيواء مصممة خصيصا لهم ونقوم برعاية المهاجرين الجدد ونحاول التصدي لموجات التدفق القادمة وهنا سأنتقل قليلا عن السؤال الخاص بالتعليم وأود أن أشير وأن أركز على أن تركيا لا تتبع ولا تنفذ الاتفاقية الخاصة بمارس 2016 وكان لذلك أثر كبير في زيادة تدفقات المهاجرين الكائنة في اليونان ولذا التدفقات ما زالت مستمرة وعلينا أن نحتوي هذه الأزمة وأن نقدم التعليم بجودة عالية وبطريقة فعالة لا أعلم إن كان هناك سؤال آخر عن طريقة تعاملنا مع الهجرة بشكل عام كدولة ولكنني أود أن أشير إلى هذا الأمر خصيصا ولدي وقت محدود خمس دقائق فقط speakers who commit to the time in this uh, panel. This is very phenomenal. سؤالي التالي لسيدة السفيرة نائلة جبر. سيدة السفيرة بصفتك رئيس اللجنة الوطنية لمكافحة الاتجار بالبشر والهجرة غير الشرعية وهي لجنة تابعة لمجلس الوزراء. لكن اسمحي لي قبل أن ألقي سؤالي أن أشارك بأمر أعتقد أنه كان ملهما لنا جميعا كإعلاميين في الفترة الماضية في الفترة الماضية كان هناك بعض المشروعات القومية من ضمنها مشروع استزراع السمكي في غليون فكل مرة كنا نذهب إلى التصوير أنا وزملائي الإعلاميين ونذهب إلى التصوير في غليون كانوا يقولون لنا من هذا الشاطئ كانت تخرج مئات من السفن للهجرة غير الشرعية وفي هذا المكان هناك الآلاف من الفرص للشباب للعمل رأينا ذلك ملهما وسؤالي لحضرتك أعود إلى سؤالي عن التجربة المصرية في شقين أولا السيطرة على الهجرة غير الشرعية واستيعاب مصر لأعداد كبيرة جدا من المهاجرين واللاجئين القادمين لها الذين نعرف أنهم أيضا بالملايين سيد الرئيس أصحاب السعادة الحضور الكريم شباب العالم مستقبل العالم مستقبل منطقة البحر المتوسط مستقبل أفريقيا والعالم حتطرق في عجالة إلى بعض المؤشرات وفقا لفرونتكست وهي كريمة على راحتك وسيبيهم يتكلموا عشان ده موضوع مهم. فين؟ في حياة بشر بتترمي بيغرقوا في الميه فما جاتش في دقيقتين وثلاثه واربعه في كل يتكلموا احنا قاعدين. شكرا سيد الرئيس. تمام. وفقا لما جاء في بيانات الفرونتكس وهي الجهاز المعني بمراقبه الحدود في اوروبا. لم تخرج سفينة واحدة من الشواطئ المصرية منذ ثلاث سنوات وأيضا فرونتكس بتقول أن عدد المصريين اللي تحركوا في هجرة غير شرعية في السنة الماضية يعني من يناير 2019 حتى نوفمبر 2019 لم يتجاوز 777 فرد استأذنك سيادة سفيرة بس نقرب من المايك شوية سود حتك نقرب من المايك استأذنك لم يتجاوز 777 فرد لدولة فيها أكثر من 100 مليون ده يدعو إلى التأمل مدير منظمة الاي او ام لما زار مصر من بضعة أشهر أنطونيو فيتورينو قال أن مصر فيها 6 مليون نبي ما بين من لديهم وضعية اللاجئ من يطمحون في وضعية اللاجئ طبعا الأخوة السوريين أخوة لهم إقامات معينة في مصر وهجرة غير شرعي المهاجر غير الشرعي في مصر لا نضعه في ملاجئ أو في معسكرات بيتحرك بحرية لم نستثمر وجود الستة مليون في مصر 
لم نساوم على ذلك اطلاقا والقانون 82 لسنه 2016 بيقسم وبيجرم تهريب المهاجرين ولكن لا يوقع عقوبه على المهاجر ده جزء من السؤال الا اذا اقترف جرما يعاقب عليه القانون المصري السؤال بسرعة عن التعامل المصري مع قضية تهريب المهاجرين هو أن لدينا رؤية متكاملة بتبدأ بإرادة سياسية في طبعا الشق الأمني ودي تعليمات رئاسية على أعلى مستوى بالنسبة للشق الأمني وده في سيطرة أمنية على الشواطئ المصرية ولكن الشق الأمني لازم ولكن غير كافي بيصحبه تنمية والتنمية هي الحل السحري بالنسبة لي مواجهة موضوع الهجرة مشروعات طبعا مش هتكلم في حضور سيد الرئيس هو اللي يقدر يتكلم عن المشروعات الكبرى كثيفة العمالة على مشروعات صغيرة متناهية الصغر والقروض على دعم الحرف التقليدية على دعم التعليم الفني كل هذا من سياسات الدولة ولكن أنا هتوقف عند جزء يخصني وهو الجزء الخاص بالجانب المؤسسي وهو إنشاء لجنة وطنية تنسيقية وده الاتجاه في العالم كله لتنسيق الجهود بالنسبة للتوعية والتدريب في مجال مواجهة الهجرة غير الشرعية زي ما حضرتك قلتي هذه اللجنة تابعة لمجلس الوزراء بتضم 27 وزارة مجالس حقوق الإنسان ورؤية مصر هي ان هي تهريب المهاجرين جريمه عبر وطنيه ولكن ايضا بنتطرق فيها الى حمايه حقوق الانسان وايضا الى عمليه غسل الاموال وبالتالي معنا في هذه اللجنه اللي بتضم الخارجيه والعدل والنيابه العامه والداخليه والدفاع وغيرهم من الوزارات لكن بتضم ايضا وحده غسل الاموال بتضم ايضا الرقابه الاداريه دي رؤيتنا هذه اللجنه معنيه عشان لا أتشيل على حضراتكم بوضع تشريعات زي ما وضعنا القانون وده كان أول قانون في منطقة الشرق الأوسط قبل هذا القانون كانت النيابة توقف في المهربين تاني يوم تضطر أنها تخرجهم لأن لا جريمة ولا عقوبة بدون نص قانوني فهذا هو أول قانون في منطقة الشرق الأوسط وإحنا بنفخر بوضع هذا القانون وفقا لكل المعايير الدولية هو قانون محترم وفي نفس الوقت وضعنا اللايحة التنفيذية حتى يتم تطبيقه وأيضا بتضع القوانين والتشريعات والدراسات ووضعت أول خريطة ولكن اليوم تغيرت الأوضاع والخريطة لازم تتغير لأن زي ما حضرتك قلتي بالنسبة لكفر الشيخ الدنيا تغيرت أنا كنت بزور موتوبس وعارفة شباب وقعدت مع شباب موتوبس لكن الوضع تغير اليوم بعد المشروعات وبعد التنمية في هذه المنطقة بتعمل توعية والتدريب ننتقل إلى التجربة المصرية ونجاحها في شيء مهم غير أن احنا وضعنا استراتيجية تشمل الدولة وتم تنفيذ أول جزء من الخطة الوطنية وبعتنا تقرير لمعالي دولة رئيس الوزراء لكن التعاون الإقليمي مهم للغاية ما تقوم به مصر بالنسبة للتوعية للأقوى في القارة الأفريقية يعني إحنا بنهني وزارة الداخلية بتجديد الاتفاق مع إيطاليا لمدة سنتين بالنسبة لتدريب الكوادر الأفريقية بالنسبة لحماية الحدود بوردو كنترول اند مانجمنت الخارجيه بتعمل تدريبات بالنسبه للدبلوماسيين الافارقه في تريبل سي بي اي قوات حفظ السلام كل ده بيتم ايضا النيابه عندها مركز تدريب قوي جدا في منطقه الشروق وبتعمل تدريبات وهنعمل تدريبات في الفتره القادمه بالنسبه لنواب عموم افريقيا. في نقطه اخيره بس ممكن الاي او ام تساعدنا فيها وهي الاوار مايجرنت دي حمله بدأتها الداخلية الإيطالية لتعريف المواطن الإفريقي بمخاطر الهجرة غير الشرعية إحنا في مصر كلجنة وطنية طلبنا ترجمتها إلى اللهجات المحلية الإفريقية هي بالإنجليزية وبالعربية والفرنسية والبرتغالية 
it was written in many languages, but not in regional dialect, so that it would reach African citizens everywhere. This is part of the support Egypt offers in regards to illegal migration, and I would like to stop here. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, because, of course, sharing success stories is not only an inspirational thing, but it has to do with paving the way. Here around this table, we have many individuals and countries sharing their challenges. My next question goes to Ms. Emilia Lacravi. She will answer in uh, French, so I will not use my French, I'll use my English. Ms. Uh, Emilia, you are a member of the uh, French Parliament representing the French abroad, and you come uh, from Moroccan origin, so your personal story is an inspirational one indeed. My question to you has to do with the challenges of uh, migrants. And these challenges are still emerging. How can countries provide development opportunities for youth, whether in the countries of origin or destination? Thank you. Désolé, je vais parler français parce que je représente les Français. Alors. Sorry for speaking French, but I represent the French abroad. On behalf of my people, I would like to thank you, Your Excellency, the President, and I would like to congratulate you in convening this great conference. Thank you so much for taking interest in youth empowerment. One day, we posed uh, the uh, question. And I spoke to people from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. How can you help and empower youth in Africa? And the answer was as, as follows. It revolves around three points. School, school, school. One thing, three times. I would also like to add another thing here. I'd like to refer to the importance of schooling. I did not choose France. My parents did so. I was uh, two years old when I went to France a long time ago, and I would like to thank this country for the high-quality education I was provided with. I uh, learned uh, at um, Catholic uh, school, and I was the only one coming from an Arab origin, and people used to ask me, where did you come from, and how do you speak uh, French so fluently? I also spent around 20 years there, but I was uh, always afraid of the other, if I may say, and uh, people were a bit uh, introvert or they were not very open towards me. But then I met many people coming from Arab origin. I have a very complex personal story. My father died when I was young. I was really young back then. And many uh, classmates uh, uh, were also of Arab origins, and people referred to me as a Moroccan girl. But I had the French nationality, I spoke French fluently, but they always referred to me as uh, a Moroccan girl. In France, they perceived me as uh, not a full uh, French citizen because I'm not blonde or I don't look like French people. The, so people always referred to my Moroccan origin. It was very hard for me to find a place or a space in this society. I would like uh, to thank France because some people say that France is the racist country, but this is not true. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been given the chance as a Moroccan uh, girl. I was given high quality education and uh, many uh, people, many Arab people assume high uh, positions. Here I'm referring to uh, female leaders of Arab or African origins. In these uh, countries, like countries of origin, the same high-level positions are not even granted to women. Presidents of uh, France through uh, history had a vision 
to have um, members in the parliament representing the diversity and the plurality of uh, France. And priority was always given to uh, women. Women were given due attention and diversity was always a key. Was the uh, participation of Ms. Emilia, I can confidently say that education is the right investment. The countries which invented, uh, which, sorry, invested in education could have a wealth of migrants, whether when it comes to the countries of origin or the countries of destination. You, when you invest in incoming migrants, you win. And when countries of origin sends migrants, they also win, even indirectly through the remittances or through um, opening new cooperation cha channels between these two countries. Said Osman. Mr. Uthman, being the representative of uh, IOM uh, and having been part uh, of uh, the many uh, of the Mediterranean uh, challenges and attempts to face them, uh, what do you think about this issue? And I do realize that you give great attention to, pro to giving um, successes to the migrants themselves and to the hosting countries. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, President Abdel Fattah Hassis, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, dear guests, at the outset, I would like to thank the people of Egypt for their hospitality, and I would like to convey my deepest thanks and appreciation to Your Excellency for the care you devote to migration and youth, especially when it has to do with illegal or irregular migration, especially when it comes to people's Security. Allow me to speak in English. إن البحر المتوسط هو أجمل بحر في العالم وقد حظي بهذه بسمعته بتوصيل قارات العالم ببعضها البعض للأسف مؤخرا حظي بسمعة سيئة تتعلق بكونه أسوأ طريق للهجرة الإنسانية حيث كانت هناك آلاف من من الضحايا في أثناء محاولات عبورهم لهذا البحر أيضا عندما نتحدث عن البحر المتوسط دائما ما نفكر في الهجرة بينما أن تعاوننا في دول المتوسط أكبر بكثير من ذلك توجد الثقافة يوجد التاريخ توجد الموارد المائية السياحة التغير المناخي وتلوث البحر كل هذه هي موضوعات تطرأ لذهننا عندما نتحدث عن تعاوننا وشراكتنا حول هذا البحر كما أننا جميعنا نتفق أن الهجرة شيء جيد وهي ما بنى هذا العالم ولكننا أيضا نتفق أن الهجرة غير النظامية تضعنا في مواجهة الكثير من مواطن الضعف التي قد لا نتمكن من مواجهتها بصورة فردية من لصالح الوقت سوف أبدأ بالحديث عن عدة نقاط وأوقفوني إذا ما تعديت الوقت المسموح لي أولا لابد أن نتحدث عن المهاجرين أنفسهم لابد أن نتحدث عن مجتمعاتهم وأسرهم لأن هذه المجتمعات هي التي تتأثر بالهجرة في الناحية المتلقية ولذلك لا بد أن نستثمر في العمل مع المجتمعات في الدول المستقبلة ودول المرور أو دول العبور ولكن المهاجرون أيضا على كاهلهم مسؤولية كبيرة تتعلق باندماجهم في المجتمع وفي الاعتراف بأنهم, بأنهم قد انتقلوا إلى دولة أخرى بطبيعة مختلفة أيضا قبل لأن نتناقش في أي استراتيجية لابد أن نتفق على أن حماية الأرواح هي لابد أن تكون في قلب أي استراتيجية نطمح إلى مناقشتها لا أعتقد أن أي منا يقبل خسارة روح واحدة لأن ذلك هو لب كل استراتيجياتنا وأيضا معظم المهاجرين هم ضحايا وليسوا مجرمين نحن نقول أن المهربين هم المجرمين في هذا الصدد وليس المهاجرين 
هنا عندما نتحدث عن الجريمة عابرة للحدود فنحن نتحدث هنا عن أكثر من دولة أكثر من منطقة وذلك يعني أن إدارة الهجرة ليست مسؤولية إقليم واحد أو منطقة أو دولة واحدة بل العالم بأسره ما يثير مخاوفنا هو كالآتي إن الهجرة لا بد أن تقوم على قرار واع ومستنير الناس لا بد أن يتفهموا منافع الهجرة عندما نتحدث عن الهجرة المشروعة ربما لا تكون, ربما لا تكون الهجرة مناسبة للجميع وذلك لا ينطبق على الجميع بشكل متساوي لأننا لدينا خبرات وشخصيات مختلفة لا يمكن للجميع الهجرة كما أننا أيضا نتحدث عن الهجرة غير النظامية هنا لا بد أن نقول أنه من الأهمية بمكان لمن يريدون أن يقوموا بهذه الرحلة أن يتفهموا المخاطر المح المخاطر الخاصة بهذه الرحلة ودعوني هنا أذكر تجربة ليبيا لقد رأيت الكثير من المعاناة من جانب الناس الذين لم يتوقعوا المخاطر التي تحيط بهذه الرحلة وكانت هناك خسارات كبيرة في الأرواح وأيضا عندما نتحدث عن الهجرة وما يواجهه المهاجرون لا بد أن نعترف بأن المهاجرين الشباب يواجهون تحديات أكثر خصوصية فيما يتعلق بالضغوط التي يواجهونها من جانب أسرهم أو من جانب مجتمعاتهم وبالتالي يقع على كاهلهم عبء النجاح في المجتمعات المتلقية أيضا في بعض الأحيان يبدأون رحلتهم ب طموحات غير واقعية ونصيحتي هنا هي أنه بمجرد أن تشعر أن ذلك شيء أن ذلك الأمر لا يناسبك فكر في العودة مرة أخرى إلى موطنك وبدء حياة جديدة هناك أيضا يوجد لدينا تجارب تختص بالعودة الطوعية وذلك شيء جيد عندما تصل إلى طريق مسدود لا تستمر وحسب في هذه الحالة لابد أن تعود إلى موطنك وأن تبدأ حياتك من جديد هناك أيضا فيما يتعلق بالهجرة غير النظامية لابد أن يكون هناك طرق قانونية للهجرة نحتاج المزيد في هذا الصدد يمكن أن يكون ذلك عن طريق اتفاقيات ثنائية أو عن طريق الهجرة المو... النظامية الموسمية حيث يقوم المهاجر بالقيام ببعض الأنشطة الموسمية والعودة مرة أخرى إلى موطنه نقطة مهمة أخرى هي أنه ربما يكون هناك مراجعة للسياسات الخاصة بالتأشيرات القائمة حاليا لأنه في بعض الأحيان يكون هناك قيود متعلقة بالمستندات وبحسابات البنوك وربما يريد بعض الشباب أن يسافروا وحسب ولا يهاجروا سوف أترك بعض النقاط لاحقا شكرا جزيلا Thank you so much, Mr. Othman. Before moving to the conclusions I need to refer to lessons learned before moving to Mr. Carlos. The main lesson here is that illegal migrant is not a very appropriate term because they are human beings. We would better use the term irregular but not illegal because we need to respect migrants and their rights to life. Thank you so much for teaching me this very insightful lesson. Um, a Sayyid organization. Through your leadership to the World Impact Alliance and your successful achievements to create influence in youth uh, lives, I think uh, you did it, I believe that you did it internationally. You have a vision to empower youth and to benefit from their abilities and to change societies. We would like you to, to share this uh, vision with the World Youth Forum today. And my second question is, international and regional organization and civil society, how can they all work together to achieve this vision? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I'm here today in Masar. I'm not here in the Arab language, but I'm here with you, inshallah. I'm here with you in the local English, but I want to thank the government of the government, and the government of Sisi, في خاك الفورس هذا يزبق على العالم ما كان أفضل.
I'm so sorry that I'm not able to speak in Arabic, but I <laughs> think uh, so much the world you forum. But can I share something? I yeah. was a witness when uh, Mr. Carlos was rehearsing this Arabic introduction, so uh, very good job. <laughs> and I didn't do it very well, I'm sorry. <laughs> It is a great honor to be uh, part of this forum, and I want to congratulate not only the forum and the government of Egypt, but also all the participants. It is very important that we have these debates, but also that we join to find and apply solutions for the problems that we're all facing. What we're doing in our organization is to look for specific solutions in problems like healthcare, environment, poverty, education, and human rights. And we're doing that by bringing together companies, institutions from different parts of the world, and also allowing young people and people from all generations to connect and to implement the solutions. So uh, what one of the things that we're doing right now is to select 100 solutions for one of the for each problem. So 500 solutions in total that are best practices from governments, best practices from companies. What are the things that we can do to actually solve the problem? And when uh, we are talking about Mediterranean issues, we normally forget about the root cause of the problem. And a lot of the problems in immigration and refugee come from sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the biggest issues that we have is that uh, the poverty that we're facing and also the problems with climate, now that I come back from COP, from the climate uh, convention in, in, in Madrid of the UN, and we are not realizing that as much as we want to talk about the future and the um, uh, 2050 agenda of the European Commission now with the Green Deal, we have to acknowledge that there's millions of people dying right now in many countries like in India, in uh, Pakistan, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa because they don't have water. And we have this framing problem where we have right now in Europe the conversation that is led by politicians that want to gain politically off the uh, refugee crisis and they gain politically with that, but they frame the conversation in a way that is not really useful. And it makes us think that there are citizens of the first class, first class citizens, and also the rest that are second class or even third class. And they excuse their discourse with the idea that uh, there may be security concerns, but quite honestly, that's for the Muslim part, considering there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world and they're uh, in the vast majority incredibly willing to support peace. And also that a lot of those refugees and migrants are not coming from Muslim countries. They are people that are just simply people of color that in the West normally uh, because of racism that we never talk about, we just don't want them very close because we are afraid of them. So I think that we need to frame the conversation in a useful manner, and I'm going to say a couple of things about it, and, and I'm going to be very, very uh, brief. First of all, there are examples of what countries are doing to handle the situation. In Uganda, for example, they are enabling the refugees to have a situation where they can participate in the economy, and that really allows them to create, because these refugees have a lot of ideas and they really want to participate, but sometimes they lack the possibility of actually working. So with these enabling environments, one thing that has happened in Uganda is that 25 percent of all the refugees are creating their own businesses. And funny enough, not only that is good for the local community, but they are actually hiring local people from Uganda. So that is a good example. Another one, uh, and you just mentioned the, the um, importance of having a way to regulate the visa. And, and it's really important. There's a concept that a lot of people don't talk about. And unfortunately, when we talk about it, we lack the political support for it, which is the humanitarian visa, which means that if I want to go to uh, the north of Mediterranean, but I don't uh, have the possibility of acquiring a visa, then I cannot travel by plane because I'm going to be stopped at the airport. And so, or I go to a refugee camp, or I go to a neighboring city and I'm going to have problems there, or I do this dangerous journey that they should know more about. Now, the, the concept was successfully implemented in the uh, last century, is that you go to a neighboring country's uh, consulate or an embassy and you are able to get a visa. So you pay your ticket to, this, to, the, to the country that you want to visit legally and then you are then hosted and that is a concept that a lot of times we just forget about and in part we think that refugees cannot pay for the ticket when the reality is that the smugglers are, are way more expensive than that. Another thing, I'm going to be very, very brief, but another concept that is very important in order to help with the refugees is that we have this possibility of matching 
preferences from the countries that are going to host and the refugees themselves. Sometimes you are lack, for example, we just mentioned that sometimes we need uh, work, uh, working people, we need young people, we may need engineers, or you can prefer, you can choose if you prefer people of one specific language. So by allowing countries and refugees to say what their preferences are, it's way easier to actually make the, the, the trip uh, uh, and, and to make it happen. And, and lastly, in terms of the solutions part, uh, we have identified several models that can be very useful in uh, education, in tourism for good, and in technology for good. And just with one sentence is, uh, through the education programs that we're doing, one is called Crossing Borders. What we're doing is to have schools from different parts of the world to do video conference calls with kids of all the parts of the world. So what we do with that is avoid problems of discrimination and racism and many others. Because if your kid is talking to people from Africa and from India and from China, and now we are talking in the Mediterranean, if our kids are talking between themselves, then there's no no way they're going to be hateful of the others because they know that they're they just people like them and they share a lot of things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlos. I would like to reiterate my thanks to all those around the table. In fact, now we come to the most important part of our discussions. One of the best things about the World Youth Forum is um, uh, actually the, has to do with the recommendations of the round table discussions and uh, other sessions, and turning these recommendations into visions, and these visions being turned into real life projects. So now we are waiting for your visions, because I think you all have your visions when it comes to tackling uh, the challenges. I think that we've focused a lot on the challenge of uh, irregular migration, but uh, I believe that when it comes to solutions, um, maybe we will uh, deal with the security solutions or even uh, digital ways of tackling this challenge because I think that uh, the digital aspect is very important when it comes to the safety of migrants in both origin and destination countries. Now, I would like to go back uh, to our guests. Mr. Futeu, your, your speech was focused about working together through security. So please, uh, what are your recommendations for this session? I think that uh, we all have identified the main problems of our region. Is uh, migration, of course, is uh, terrorism, security, conflicts, climate changes. So the question now is how we can approach and solve these issues. And uh, I believe that, first of all, the governments, our countries have to work together, bilaterally, trilaterally, regionally. This is the only way to face all these issues. Of course, we have to encourage also people-to-people -people initiatives. We want the support of our people. We want the support of our youth. And as you can see, we have a vibrant, a dynamic youth, and it's very important not to disappoint all these people. We have to give them a better future. We have to give them a better world. And we have to work hard to do it. Because, Mr. President, unfortunately, we are in a region with so many problems, and we have to do something now. The cooperation between the Arab world and European Union, it's an important tool. And we have to take advantage of this. Of course, security, as I said before, is not just to say that I am militarily more power than you. We have to respect each other. We have to respect human rights. We have to respect the sovereignty of each country. And this is the most important thing 
if we want a peace, if we want stability, and if we want prosperity in our region. And together, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> Mrs. Maria, Maria Camilleri, please share with us your recommendation uh, for this session. <laughs> Unemployment, in my opinion, brings a long frustration which can turn into violence, and we do not want that. I recommend that there is dialogue between all the countries, countries coming together, representatives from trade unions, governments, and employers' association to come together. Because I believe that such dialogue will contribute towards employment opportunities, workers' rights, and most of all, protect human rights. And here comes in the role of youth, because the role of youth is a very, very important instrument. I believe that we need to engage young people more directly and ensure that they themselves are part of this conversation. I address the young people. You are able to influence policy that brings peoples and nations together rather than creating distrust. You are the leaders of tomorrow. And may I conclude with a quote by a young inspiring leader, Malala. And she said, I raise my voice, not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. And this is up to you, the, all the young people over here and the rest of the world. Thank you. The voiceless are not heard. Thank you so much for your contribution. Mr. Elias Bosab. you focused uh, during your speech uh, on uh, cooperation for the best interests of youth. What about your recommendations for this session, sir? Thank you. In fact, uh, the recommendations that I can speak about um, are a bit um, similar to last year's recommendations from His Excellency President Assisi. Uh, the World Youth Forum, from my perspective, is one of the most important and powerful tools that we need to affect change in our worlds and in our countries through believing in the role of youth and uh, uh, how they can build their own future and how they can be empowered to do so. Your Excellency, the President, uh, I would like to recommend uh, having some sort of partnership between the World Youth Forum and other similar forums uh, throughout the world. I used to be the Minister um, I used to be the Minister of Education, and we uh, created uh, a body uh, to be uh, called the Forum of uh, Young Lebanese People, or um, and uh, the executive director of this agency is right here. I think each country of the world should have a replica of uh, the World Youth Forum, and it should be like a national edition, and uh, then when the there are recommendations from each country. There would be a body bringing all of them together so that we won't only be speaking to youth in our countries and telling them that we want to improve things for you and and so on, but we would actually be empowering them. And the most important thing is that we participate in the awareness throughout these countries. I would like to give you another example. What we're witnessing in our world include fair demands by the youth. But sometimes there are external influences that take them uh, 
uh, two uh, different ways. Egypt went through this and it went out safely from this crisis due to the wisdom of the military institution and the army. Because uh, if there is no preservation of the country, uh, there won't be any hope for the future. In Lebanon, we have a similar phase going on. We need to work on awareness among youth. We need to preserve our state, our military institution, and the army. And of course, we should give priority to youth in order to speak about their concerns, and that they should be the, and you should be the ambassadors to their countries regarding this forum. Thank you so much, Mr. Elias. Of course, when we speak about awareness, we need to speak about also different kinds of awareness for migrants and for their future in the new countries. Ms. Amelia Lakravi. We would like to hear your input in the recommendation part. This um, has uh, to do with the recommendations I can make. We are not uh, discussing war, for example, but rather the tensions and the tough situation resulting in some of the uh, crises in certain countries. There are also matters that have to do with economy and elections. These things affect the daily lives of citizens. The situation is hard and many people are suffering. We should believe in our ability to move on and we should take IT security and cybersecurity into consideration. I would like to say in this regard that in France there is a model in place, a model that is very effective regarding uh, cyber security, IT security, and we tried uh, hard to oblige concerned parties to cooperate in order to manage things effectively. We engaged all the stakeholders, including government and other institutions. These bodies provide consultations for the um, government and the parliament in order for us to be able to keep our children safe and secure. We also established a network or let me say a body that is affiliated to the state in the form of an organization playing a very effective role because we wanted to achieve security for our people. Now let me move to the European level. We have an organization called INISA that is responsible for IT security across Europe. I dream that if we can here in Egypt, this Mediterranean country, this country can be uh, the intersection between the Middle, the Middle East and Europe uh, in order to keep the security of everyone. Why can't we uh, establish a body equivalent to these organizations in order for Egypt to be a communication hub at the regional level? I cannot here give uh, an opinion, but I really want for us to create similar organizations in Egypt, and I want all these organizations all over the world to cooperate one another. So for example, in France, we have an issue with the training, uh, rehabilitation, and uh, institutional effectiveness. There is another problem when it comes to monitoring. We are trying to work collectively to respond efficiently on the ground because we want to address the root causes of the problems. 
That's why we should have an effective response through good monitoring systems. For example, tracking any suspicious bodies that might destabilize the country in order to be able to address similar challenges. In this regard, I would also like to tell you that Egypt and Africa are rich, rich with their youth. I have another dream. We want to allocate a higher budget for education. Now I will go back to the French model. 30% of the state's budget is allocated to education. The average in Africa is 6% only for the education sector across the continent. That's why the state should build schools, rehabilitate youth. We also need to empower women because women represent 50% of the society. So 3.6 billion women are living across the world. And I'm not saying that women should assume uh, all high-level positions, but women should be represented equally like men because women and men complement one another. Also, I'll move now to immigration. What I find very interesting is a figure. There are 10,000 people who are not on the radar, they are not uh, accounted for. What happened to these people? Where did these children go? We uh, have what we call an industry of organ kidnapping. Maybe these 10,000 children disappeared because their organs were kidnapped. I'm also a bit worried and a bit concerned regarding the future of the world. What happened to these missing or unaccounted for children? Again, when I say that Egypt and Africa are rich, then I can say confidently that 50 years ago, the World Bank said that 4% of the human and cultural heritage is intangible. And this refers to skills, knowledge, science, among other things. When it comes to Egypt, you are rich with your youth. So now, uh, this has been more than five minutes, but uh, uh, regarding the digital security institutions, I think this is a very good idea, and having an organization for that among Mediterranean countries, I think that this is a great recommendation for this session. Now, uh, Your Excellency, Naila Gabbara, uh, we need your recommendations. How can we uh, act uh, upon um, uh, the, this issue, the issue of irregular migration in Mediterranean, between Mediterranean countries? Okay, I have several recommendations. First, uh, having awareness uh, regarding acceptance, acceptance of the other. This form pays great attention for this culture, this awareness of the other and acceptance of the other. If we do not develop this mindset with our children from a young age, we will not be able to achieve cooperation between Mediterranean countries, uh, whether developed or developing. And I think this could be done through media, through education, through families. So this is a very important point, I think. Uh, Her Excellency from France spoke about uh, the uh, non-accompanied minors who uh, go on irregular migration journeys. And in Egypt, uh, Article 3, 
three of the relevant law uh, allows the state uh, to retrieve uh, the Egyptian unaccompanied minors, and I think it's a very important point, and you are completely right about it. And I think that this uh, brings us also to the issue of uh, ch uh, exchange of experience between uh, different countries uh, when there are uh, countries where there are better strategies, better legislation. I think uh, we have many common uh, customs and traditions. So on uh, both sides of the Mediterranean, this would make it easier to exchange experience. Another very important point that I care for is the regional African cooperation. Maybe you would think that this is uh, a bit different from what we're speaking about, but it's not. When we're speaking about illegal or irregular migration, uh, as you said, I think the flows from the south part of the uh, continent is very important. We need to pay great attention to securing the lives of young men and women in Africa to provide them with uh, awareness and to provide them with good alternatives. Uh, when we are conducting our, our activities in Egyptian governorates, we always speak about alternatives. Usually, uh, youth are in a hassle. They want to achieve a better standard of living, but they are not aware of other alternatives in order to achieve safe uh, lives in their countries before going on that journey of death that has been mentioned before. Now, regarding uh, Egypt's part, uh, uh, where his Excellency the President uh, uh, spoke about in the General Assembly meeting years ago and also in Valletta Conference. Of course, there are many imbalances, economic imbalances across Mediterranean countries when it comes to a population as well. Uh, we have also demographic uh, gaps. Uh, there are countries with uh, uh, a huge population of youth. When some of the developed countries opened their borders to one million refugees, this was not only due to uh, the respect of human rights that we all believe in, but I think that this was also due to the needs of the labor market. So we need to be frank, we need to be open. What are the needs of the labor market in order to be able to offer regular migration, seasonal migration, or rotational migration? This is of paramount importance between both sides of the Mediterranean. Also, the destination countries uh, or the receiving countries, it's very important that we offer support to them, just like it's the case with Lebanon. Also, we need to offer support to migrants, whether they are regular or irregular. And Egypt has also um, actually offered a very good model in this regard, especially when it comes to the health services. In, a, in the presidential initiative of 100 million healthy lives, Egypt offers all health assistance to all those living in Egypt, whether they are migrants or Egyptian citizens. And the WHO um, has mentioned th that. Um, so this is very important also. Again, I would like to say that we need to cooperate for development. Uh, maybe the develop countries on the other side of the Mediterranean would pay a lot for research purposes uh, regarding the ships carrying uh, migrants. But if they just spend a fraction of that for development projects in the countries of origin, I think that this would be a better solution. Thank you so much, Your Excellency the Ambassador. <laughs> I think that these recommendations are ambitious, but not impossible. Uh, Mr. Sofia Karaski, we would like to hear your input. I had written a lot of things and taken a lot of notes today. And, um, and I think I come back with a full luggage of, uh, of tips that I can give back to, to my government. Though, I feel that our, my, my contribution would not be complete if I didn't mention what I heard from the youth today. So inside this room, you have future leaders, youth leaders, that this empowerment that the government can give them, they have already tried to find it elsewhere. They have tried to find it in the civil society, in NGOs. They have tried to find it 
in organizations, youth organizations around the world. The youth today are activists. Are activists when you see them talking about the climate change or the things that speak dearly to their heart. So if I can make one recommendation to His Excellency is that this youth forum goes even further into a more tangible input. And I think that the next step should be a permanent steering committee that advises the European Union, African unions, and Asian unions into, more or less what you mentioned, into providing all this input, this precious input that was delivered in workshops, in plenary sessions, to the governments and the deciding, the deciding uh, uh, organization. So I think we should have a tangible result yes. out of all these important discussions that we're holding here. And mm -hmm. please allow me another minute in order to mm -hmm. mention what these people told me today. The Nostos family that we gathered with uh, Nabila Nakram and Mr. Foti with youth, expats, Egyptians who live abroad, Greeks and Cypriots who are here for the forum. They said that they want more joint university programs. They said that they want MUN, MUN style, simulation style exchanges, school trips and summer schools. They would like to be ambassadors of what they hear at the World Forum back in their country. And they would like more cultural programs. They would like to focus more on what unites us and not on what divides us. We talked a lot about security, and of course we should. We talked a lot about raising awareness, but I think that these young people here are the best ambassadors in order to convey the message of unity and, of course, coexistence and abiding by international law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this valuable share. Mr. Osman Bilbisi, I think uh, you came up with a already. You, you, you had it already uh, from the early beginning of this session. Uh, thank you very much. I will, I will try to be also very quick. Uh, the private sector have a very important role to play, and public-private sector partnership is very important if we want to find opportunities. Uh, when we talk about recommendations, we have to recognize that we have to cover short, medium, and long-term planning. So all recommendations need to come together in a coherent way where the short term will meet also the longer term. Uh, one of the recommendations also is also sustainable support for countries who are hosting very large number of migrants and refugees. And here I can easily mention from this region, for example, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and definitely now what we see around the Mediterranean with Greece hosting an increasing number, Malta. And so it is, has to be a sustainable, I would say, support for the countries. Uh, also, when we talk, we have to rec have recommendations for the countries of origin inform migrants about the risks of irregular migration. And here we can also refer to the good example Ambassador Jabber just mentioned about aware migrants and our good uh, cooperation on that. Uh, also train and invest in education and skills needed for labor market. And the very important thing here would be the accreditation of certificates. We need our certificates to be recognized at the other side that will allow better opportunities for youth to work. Uh, we have to be ready to receive our people back if they think that they cannot continue their journey. We have to be prepared from the side of the family and the community to receive them back. We need to make sure that we provide all the support needed for our nationals, including consular services and assistance along the route and through the journey to make sure that they are not left alone. And we need to maintain strong connection with our people abroad. And this can contribute to large development. Uh, also, the majority of movements, if we talk about continental movements, I would like to give Africa as an example, are within the same continent. And to create more jobs in the continent, we have to make sure that we use our resources and raw materials. We provide the added value within the same continent. So instead of exporting raw materials, we export manufactured and semi-manufactured products to maintain, uh, I would say, to create more jobs. For the countries of transit, ensure protection of the migrants, have clear laws and policies to deal with migration, especially irregular migration, and definitely at the country of destination, integration programs, language skills, uh, identify job opportunities, and access to health, education, and services. Just one last message for the migrants themselves. If migration to turn to be very difficult, 
don't, pre, don't think twice to go back home, and there are programs that will support that. I would also like to mention the example of Egypt, where we have a good program for volunteer return, and it is working well, and upon return, people would receive also the integration packages back home to be able to live within the community. Check if the reason for your migration can be achieved back home, and also the last message, migrants need to be prepared for integration within the receiving communities and both sides should understand and respect the differences and diversity is always a positive factor to build states and we see Egypt as a good example of that. Thank, thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. Osman, you refer to creating job opportunities and to uh, the return of uh, migrants. To conclude, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Carlos Santius. Young leader here in the World Youth Forum, please show us how you will lead them to inspire the world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. It's a big one, uh, but I think I have uh, sort of an answer. Uh, we are advocating for a concept that is the following, and it's the three pillars that I believe everybody should leave upon and it doesn't matter what your age is, but for the sake of the argument, for youth is especially important. Save the world, make money, be happy. And what this means is that no matter who you are and where you are in life, you need these three things in order to live a meaningful life. And it is impossible to live without providing any value to society. So you really need to do something that is beyond yourself. Uh, I think that we have all experienced the feeling that we have to do something else in order to have a meaning in our life and to have a purpose. So that is the first one. And uh, my fellow panelists just said that young people right now are activists. They all think that their life has to have some, some sort of uh, contribution to society or to the environment. So Save the World is going to be important and we need to be clear on what can we do. And there's a concept that is the for-profit social impact or the idea of doing well by doing good, which is instead of thinking that or you make money or, and, and you're evil, or you help the others and you're the good guy, there's a lot of space in between where you can do a lot of things that are good for your career, good for your uh, economic development, but also uh, really solve problems. And I think that that is the, the, the way to go. That's the save the world part. And the way we're doing that is, for example, we are uh, in, uh, implementing in schools instead of having all the kinds of assignments that you have, write, uh, you have to write things that are normally very theoretical, uh, we are using the SDGs as a model. So we allow kids to have little projects that they create and they have to think about how would they solve those problems practically. That's the first part. The second part, no matter who you are, if you are in the wealthiest country or in, you are in a, in a developing country, you need to have the right conditions to live. It is important that you have at least the minimum and as uh, much as you can so you live comfortably and well. I'm not talking about being hyper rich. I'm saying that we all need to have the ways to make money. And in order to do that, and this is what we are advocating in the education system, is the idea that our kids are overprotected right now. And it is fine that we avoid them having you know, the child labor that we used to have. The problem is that right now our kids and young generations are uh, being kept in a bubble until they are 25. So they never get to experience what the real world is until they get out of our university. And then they stumble upon a fantastic situation where because of the disruption that we're living in AI and many other concepts, we are going to face a disruption in 50% of the jobs. So whatever you've been studying is not useful and you don't even know how to make money. And you do need to make money. So what we're doing here, both in schools and we're trying to create an online program that is for free for people in all kinds of uh, uh, situations. So they have the right skills that allow them to make money. And I'm going to mention just a couple of them. I, I, I know I don't have a lot of time. Uh, first of all, every individual, no matter how old you are, should be able to learn how to sell. Sales are absolutely crucial. I don't care who you are and what is your sector. You need to be able to say, this is what I offer, this is what I can do, and I need to find clients and convince them to buy my product or services. If you don't know how to sell, 
you're going to have a lot of problems. But that happens also if you're not able to do public relations, if you're not able to uh, use the internet to sell uh, those products, or you are not able to use the internet to promote yourself or to promote uh, a service. Also, coding skills and public speaking are very, very important. And we're trying to include those skills inside of the education systems by doing trials and then advocating that and presenting that to the UNESCO and other organizations. But I think that everybody, regardless if you have or not, the school that is teaching you those skills should go to YouTube and find some tutorials to learn how to do those skills because it's going to allow you to prosper. Okay? And the third part is be happy and healthy. And I say this separately because we all want to be happy and we all have very uh, clear misconceptions about happiness. A lot of people think that money will bring you happiness and then you are rich and you're not happy. Or people think that if you help others, you will be happy. But if you're helping others all the time for 10 years and you live a miserable life, it is possible that you're not really enjoying your life and you're going to regret at some time. So what we are trying to uh, explain is that uh, happiness depends on a lot of self-awareness and a lot of work on doing uh, the things that you like and to be in with the people that you like and to travel and to take care of yourself and to take care of mental health. That is a huge issue and we don't talk about it enough. So I don't really need anybody to have a specific set of, of, of balance in, this, in these pillars, but everybody needs to have those three parts, save the world, make money, be happy, and our education system should really include uh, specific um, uh, implementations that allow us to go in that direction. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlos. Your Excellency, the President, we started by speaking about uh, uh, fostering Mediterranean regional cooperation, and then we delved into more complicated details. Now, Your Excellency, we need your input on the matter. It's a very difficult task. It's a very difficult task. Allow me at the outset to welcome all of you and to thank you for the contributions you offered. Allow me also to mention that in Egypt we had an approach regarding uh, what uh, has happened in our region. Uh, it was implemented throughout the five to six uh, past years. I mean, if we can't solve the problem radically, we need to alleviate its uh, effects. If we're speaking about terrorism, irregular migration, um, uh, organized crime, all the themes touched upon in the morning or now. I agree with all of what you said, but if we can't reach a comprehensive solution, then we need to speak about uh, a solution for the time being. Let's say that uh, what happened throughout the past 10 years has created a state of security imbalance in our region. And when this took place, the pillars uh, on which the countries were built, regardless the, uh, whether they're south or north of the Mediterranean, but let's speak about southern Mediterranean countries. There was some sort of stability where we could have some organized procedures, even when it had to do with the irregular migration. However, such balance, such order was tampered with, and the impact of which uh, we're seeing in Syria, in uh, the Sahel and Saharan countries, uh, we see it in Somalia, we see it in, we saw it in Egypt uh, in a previous time. So when we're speaking about getting the national states back, this was not a bias to a certain regime. It was not a bias to a certain individual. It was a bias to a certain status, the status of stability, because the imbalance, the strategic imbalance that took place was something that we would all have to face uh, sooner or later. You all spoke about um, refugees in Egypt uh, from uh, different countries, but in Egypt we don't call these people refugees. We call them guests. They are our guests. Whether they are five million, six millions, we do not speak of refugees. We speak of guests. 
and Her Excellency uh, Ambassador Gobr said that these figures uh, come from international statistics. But since September 2016, we've been able to prevent irregular migration, uh, whether that was through land or sea. Now, I would like to um, enlarge the scope of our discussion so that I might be able to explain to you what I have to say. Egypt managed to do that when the country regains its stability, the stability that the country lost uh, through the first year since 2011 to 2016. So. It's not about the will of the state only. It's the will of the state and the capability of the state. This capability that was regained by September 2016, one way or another. This means that we were able to control our borders uh, in accordance with the commitment of our state towards our citizens and towards our country. Our citizens, we had to prevent them uh, from just jumping into the sea and losing their lives consequently. And then we would be shouldering the responsibility. And uh, I don't know whether or not we can take some of the participants uh, in the forum and take them to streets where uh, people are working and they have businesses, people who we call guests. Um, these guests, they have businesses in Egypt and we do not allow any forms of uh, uh, negative treatment uh, of them. Uh, or even a negative mention of them in the media or in the eyes of public opinion. Once more, we need to speak of something important. Instead of wasting time on speaking about terrorism and migration, we need to speak of the more important uh, issues. In Syria, if the state regains its stability and control, I think that all the millions in neighboring countries will come back. So the more we uh, postpone the measures to be taken, the more things deteriorate in Syria. So while we're speaking, we need to bear in mind that these ideas need to be materialized, but it's very difficult within the con current context of the region. So now you're still speaking about where these refugees are going to go, uh, where you're speaking of uh, support uh, given to host countries. What about helping their, their countries of origin? How can this be achieved that countries just uh, uh, stop interfering in the Syrian affairs and in other countries as well. And what they perceive as their interest, that Syria would remain unstable. I don't want to mention any names or any countries. What about Libya? The same applies to Libya. It has become a transit country, and uh, in 2007, 2008, and 2009, it was not uh, a transit country. It did not uh, allow irregular migration to cross over to Europe. So now, what's going on in Libya? And now I'm addressing all those who can hear me now. Who has, I mean, our national security in Egypt is very much related to that of Libya. So, there ha so we could have intervened in Libya, and we had the cap and we have the capabilities to do so, but we did not do so. We respected. Uh, the country and we chose to preserve the fraternity between us and the Libyan people because the Libyan people wouldn't have ever forgotten 
um, such interference if it had taken place. So why don't we deal with matters uh, uh, like that in the region in order for the national state to regain its status in order to minimize the problem? Uh, these problems from 2011 up till uh, now are uh, like the domino effect, uh, a crisis accumulating on top of another crisis. What's happening in Lebanon? And I hope that my brother, the um, Lebanese minister, uh, would accept these words from me. I mean, what happens in Lebanon was the result of accumulation of crises, like he, His Excellency mentioned. So, what if things deteriorate in Lebanon to much worse? Then we're going to have not only Syria, but also Lebanon who are facing the same crisis. The crisis would have an enlarged scope. It won't e the crisis won't have to do with only migrants or refugees from Syria. It will also reach Lebanon. Imagine those 4 million Lebanese people getting affected by the same crisis. I hope uh, that you understand uh, what I mean. Then there could be some displacement to Europe or to other neighborly countries. So I think that we've already demanded this. The, nation, that the national state should come back, should regain its status. And five years ago, people used to listen to this and just speak about irrelevant points. We we used to say that there were going to be catastrophic impacts, but the point is we need to regain these countries that lost a huge deal of their national sovereignty. The other point that I need to emphasize is that we had a vision when we said that national armies are the ones in charge of the in the the stability and security inside their countries. Why did we say that? In order to avoid having armed militias, in order to avoid having terrorism, because national armies are unbiased. They don't have any uh, affiliations or biases. They only care for their homelands. And this is why I, I ask this question. Why, from all the countries of the region, was, the only, was Egypt the only survivor? Because of Egypt's army. The army is made up of Muslims and Christians alike. From Upper Egyptians, people from Lower Egypt, all of them are equals. And, of course, the army has only its national affiliation, the affiliation to the country. So, when we were speaking about uh, instability, it was always uh, a result uh, uh, of uh, implementing the agendas of external actors. Why can't the government in Libya uh, affect any change now? Because unfortunately, they are hostage to the armed militias in uh, Tripoli. Unfortunately, if we keep on uh, dealing with things according to individual interests, things are not going to work out. Uh, our best interest is that we come together in order to solve the problems and face the issues collectively. When we speak of terrorism, again, here I have to say that it has become a tool, a means in the light of the development or the new warfare, the fourth and fifth generation 
of digital warfare. It's a tool in order to destabilize countries politically. And any measure that we need to take or any country that needs to take a measure uh, against another country uh, needs to be governed by international legitimacy and international law, except for terrorism. No one can hold terrorists accountable. Why? Because there is no designated entity that we can hold accountable. So we need to agree here that we cannot accept using terrorism to achieve political purposes. What about Egypt? By the way, I'm not marketing my country, but I'm just uh, emphasizing that we had and still have a vision. We never conspire with anyone, no matter how, how many differences we have. And when I say conspire, uh, it refers to ha to using legitimate, legitimate or illegitimate tools, usually illegitimate tools. But Egypt, even when there are issues that are very sensitive, when it has to do with its national security, has never gone into any conspiracy against any other country. So maybe some people would have the view that we are um, exposing uh, our national security because things do not work out uh, according to the value to these noble and lofty values. Yes, maybe I've heard this before, but uh, we are still determined to solve our problems, even with those that we have differences with through patience uh, and through negotiations, because we believe that uh, conspiring or using terrorism or armed intervention, the impact of all of those will be detrimental to all of us. The evidence which is that in 2003, there was an intervention in Iraq. What was the impact? What were the results? 16 years on after this intervention, Was, is this the Iraq that we dreamt of? And I hope that this won't cause any problem with our Iraqi brothers and sisters, because I only mean to enrich our discussion. We need to learn from the lessons that we have before us. 16 years ago, there was an intervention in Iraq. And now we have ISIL in uh, Syria and in Iraq, and with combat going on for three to four years, with, with Iraq uh, being almost completely destroyed. Iraq used to be an incredibly wealthy country. And I'm, I, I'm not defending Arab countries. I will still speak about African countries and I'll speak about irregular migration from the south to the north in one way or another. But my point is that this problem uh, could have been many, minimized. We could have had, uh, we could have had an organized dialogue uh, that would have spared us all the impacts we suffer from in the region today. And this applies to Europe and to South Mediterranean countries. Now, oh, many points have been raised regarding uh, providing or creating job opportunities in the South Mediterranean countries and African countries because you spoke about happiness, about making money, and all of these are important points. And we've already mentioned that if you want to change the face of the African continent throughout 10 years, then we need to have a continental program or continental projects for infrastructure in the continent uh, that will cost us 200 billion US dollars. This is not uh, a high price to be paid by the world, and it's not going to be a grant. It's going to be a loan, and it will be to the purpose of changing the future of Africa to the better. If we are speaking now about uh, 200 billion US dollars and 1.3 billion human beings that could reach two billions. 
in several years most of them are young people then we need to address the relevant uh, issues when these numbers increase it means also an increase of the relevant threats and by the way i've mentioned that during my visits to all countries um, china japan europe i said that africa is a new promising market it's just passing through a difficult phase when we change this market to increase the income um, of the population, then it will be a very promising market for international uh, commerce and trade. And now going back to the issue of irregular migration, it's not that we have a magical wand, but uh, we need to speak of practical solutions. I've written all what you have mentioned in order to benefit from it. But I just want to say that uh, sometimes uh, when we speak in forums, uh, in conferences, uh, uh, everything seems very rosy, but implementation on the ground is a whole different thing. Now, when we speak about different uh, forms of migration, whether rotational, seasonal, regular, regular or irregular, all what you said is really important. But uh, I think that things could be better if things had been more stable in different countries, especially uh, like countries uh, of uh, the Sahel and Sub-Saharan countries. Uh, the desertification uh, in Africa is an issue. What about people who used to thrive on agriculture and then their livelihoods uh, have been compromised? So there are internal waves of migration, and this leads to instability and other further internal problems and domestic problems. Also, when I speak about serial crises or the domino effect of crises, we need to bear this concept in mind because these issues need to be tackled collectively. We can tackle them um, individually. Once more, I would like to go back to Egypt. Have we managed to be successful in our endeavors throughout the past five years? The answer is yes, because when there were Egyptian migrants coming back from Libya, we had to deal with that. There were um, hundreds of thousands of youth, uh, Egyptian youth who used to work in Libya. When the crisis took place there, they had to go back to Egypt. That was one of the negative impacts on the country. But uh, we carried on our infrastructure program, which was unprecedented in Egypt. Why? In order to create opportunities, job opportunities for people. Otherwise, these unemployed youth would have uh, had a detrimental effect on the country. So what was the impact of this infrastructure program? It uh, led Egypt to a completely different level of investment and development. The whole world now is asking this question. How could Egypt do that in five years? Once more, the answer is if we are keen on solving the problems of security and stability in our region, then the par our partner countries, uh, whether in Europe or in other parts of the world, need to address this issue as follows, that this issue touches us all. If you think that postponing the solution or avoidance uh, or getting into conflicts regarding the solutions. You, you need to know that all of this has a detrimental effect on all of us. Regaining peace and stability in our region is key, as well as addressing issues in a frame from, from, from a wider perspective is also a key. It's a must. The recommendation that we need to convince people of 
people outside the scope of this forum is as follows. There is something that I didn't manage to mention this morning. I think that's part of respecting differences and variety throughout the whole world has to do with respecting that values of other countries cannot be applied in our countries. If we say that we are different, we're all speaking uh, about uh, differences and respecting such differences and so on, then this means that there are some countries that need to understand that they cannot uh, intervene in other countries' matters. And we need to be aware of our differences, even in our endeavors to reform. We're different in our visions. We can't speak uh, about uh, the development uh, in the southern, South Mediterranean countries being equal to that uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean. And so nobody can actually enforce change or force it. I think that we could have seen different versions of events than what happened in our countries. I don't know if I've managed to explain my idea clearly or not, that uh, you have to market your ideas uh, well. I need to benefit from you in that regard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, President. This flexible conversation regarding challenges in security development in Mediterranean countries turned into opportunities for a successful implementation through continuous cooperation and engaging the youth. I would like to sincerely thank Your Excellency, the President, and I would like to thank all of our esteemed panelists participating with us today and sharing their inputs and recommendations. Sincere thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thank you.